Okay. Uh, yeah. I'll introduce then Jan on, uh, on some libertarian dictionary definitions of other libertarians, isn't it? Uh, okay. What is uh, Alleged libertarians. Alleged libertarians are. Ah. Encyclopedia. Oh, he's not a libertarian. He's not a libertarian. All, will be, all will be revealed. Quite right, too. <laughs> okay, Valentine and Zwolinski on libertarianism. On libertarianism because that's the title of their encyclopedia entries. So, two encyclopedia entries on libertarianism have come to my attention. <clears throat> One might almost say that the weaknesses of the one are complemented by the weaknesses of the other, so comprehensive are the errors found in them jointly. As innocent members of the public are at risk of reading these accounts of libertarianism, I thought it desirable to reply to them. I begin with the one on which I have by far the most to say, Valentine's libertarianism. This is a criticism of Peter Valentine's Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy entry on libertarianism. This is an entry one might expect would use philosophy to explain libertarianism or classical liberalism generally and evaluate major criticisms of it. But in it, Valentine de de devotes much space to discussing only self-ownership and natural resource egalitarianism. Before I begin my specific responses, it might help the reader to know, at least in outline, my own preferred theory of interpersonal liberty as opposed to other senses of liberty, whether ideological or not. This is that liberty is the absence of interpersonal proactively imposed costs, or for brevity, the absence of proactive impositions. And thus libertarianism is the ideology of the minimization and rectification of any such proactive impositions. I shall not immediately attempt to further explain and unpack these conceptions of liberty and libertarianism. What follows might appear pedantic to some people, but in the world of scholarship, pedantic ought to be a term of pr praise, more or less. Evil Moreover, one theory about philosophy itself that occurs to me is that it just is being pedantic about presuppositions. On the other hand, some listeners may scoff at my self-styled pedantry and see my own arguments as simply muddled and mistaken and their precise arguments to that effect are what I would most value as a response to my own. Valentine's encyclopedia entry begins thus. Libertarianism, in the strict sense, is the moral view that agents initially fully own themselves and have certain moral powers to acquire property rights in external things. It will be necessary to break this sentence into parts. Libertarianism in the strict sense. There is no one strict sense of libertarianism as far as I can tell. There is a cluster of competing theories that agree only on the abstract principle of promoting interpersonal liberty. Some of these theories will have more pre precision and some less. If we were to look for the majority view, then we might find something like the suggested view, but I would not see it as strict or as correct. Is the moral view. Libertarianism is certainly normally held as a moral view. However, it is conceivable for someone to advocate libertarianism as, for instance, one objective economic advice on how to promote prosperity, or two, for purely self interested reasons, it is better for the advocate than any other ideology, or three, even for misanthropic reasons, if he believes that this would be a human disaster and wishes that to occur. But we can imagine an entire world with such people in uh, and holding no moral views. Surely they would still be referring to libertarianism. Thus libertarianism, libertarianism is not inherently, in the strict sense, a moral view. Or if we are to dismiss such logical possibilities as irrelevant to the collective sociological fact of libertarianism as a moral view, then we should at least concede that it has an objective content that is entirely separable from the moral advocacy of that content. I mention this partly because it is sometimes helpful, even crucial, in an argument about libertarianism and other ideologies to distinguish factual points from moral points. And if we allow people to insist that libertarianism is, in the strict sense, 
or a priori or necessarily or analytically or conceptually or whatever, a moral view, then this conflation often makes the process of some philosophical argument concerning a factual or moral aspect difficult or impossible. I speak from experience, particularly with respect to critics of libertarianism, but uh, even some advocates too, who insist on bringing up moral arguments where they are not germane to the issue in question and thereby muddy the philosophical waters. That agents fully own themselves. Neither is it necessary that libertarians hold that agents initially fully own themselves. Strictly speaking, I do not hold this view myself. If we start with a pre-propertarian theory of interpersonal liberty, then, in a strict sense, agents ipso facto do not initially fully own themselves because no one yet owns anything. And it is a contingent matter whether observing such liberty will result in self-ownership. We can imagine someone being born in a position whereby their very existence will begin as an enormous threat to others. For instance, someone born as a hyper-infectious fatal disease carrier who is bound to kill others unless he is himself first killed. As that would make him an intolerable proactive imposition upon others, he cannot own himself in the sense of having a libertarian property claim to preserve his own body. For other people have a stronger libertarian claim to destroy him in their own self-defence. All examples are likely to be somewhat far-fetched, perhaps, but the very fact that they are possible in principle shows that libertarianism th in theory, need not pres presuppose the inherent legitimacy of private property rights, even initially in one's own body. And thus we can show the errors of such related criticisms of libertarianism as that, one, it presupposes that private property is necessary, two, it is defined in terms of private property, and three, it presupposes that private property is moral and have certain moral powers to acquire property rights in external things. It follows from an objective libertarian theory that ownership of external things is also possible. But we need a theory and circumstances to show how and what objective property follows. Then, whether such ownership is never, sometimes, or always moral is an entirely separate matter. At the end of his brief introduction, Valentine distinguishes what he calls left and right libertarianism. Both endorse full self-ownership, but they differ with respect to unowned natural resources. Right libertarianism holds that typically such resources may be appropriated by the first person who discovers them, mixes her labor with them, or merely claims them. Left libertarianism, by contrast, holds that unappropriated natural resources belong to everyone in some egalitarian manner. It is clear to me that so-called right libertarianism is a kind of libertarianism, as I would normally use the term. It is not clear to me that so-called left libertarianism is a kind of libertarianism. It would seem just as confusing to call it right egalitarianism. It is clearly a combination of self-ownership, an idea not unique to libertarianism anyway, and some version of natural resource egalitarianism. If there were at least some theory that purported to explain that liberty entails natural resource equality, despite what most self-described libertarians think, then things might be different. But that is not what is argued at any point in the article. And so it is somewhat odd to have an encyclopedia entry on libertarianism that discusses something that is not apparently part of libertarianism at all. That said, I think it is theoretically possible to use natural resources in a way that flouts liberty. But I cannot see any connection with egalitarianism, except in the vacuous sense that everyone is equally entitled to liberty. In section one on self-ownership, we are told that full self-ownership is sometimes thought to guarantee that agents have a certain basic liberty of action. But this is not so, for if the rest of the world natural resources and artifacts is fully maximally owned by others one is not permitted to do anything without their consent since that would involve the use of their property however this paradox can be avoided with a pre-propertarian theory of libertarian liberty 
For by my own pre propertarian theory, it would proactively impose on others to own all of the natural resources in such a way that this occurs. If Valentine had a theory of liberty, he might also see this. As, this, as things stand, he cannot even say what, if anything, self-ownership has to do with liberty. It is taken as an axiom that self-ownership is identical with liberty when there ought to be philosophical analysis. To be fair, Valentine has a lot of company among libertarian theorists in this matter. Valentine continues, let us consider five important objections to full self-ownership. And in each case, I will give my own immediate responses to those posed objections. I'm obliged to take Valentine's words at face value, though I cannot always make complete sense of them. And so we are told that one objection to full interpersonal self-ownership is that it denies that the individual has any obligation to help others in need, except through voluntary agreement or prior wrongdoing. But people can have a moral obligation without having an, an enforceable obligation. And I guess, without doing a survey, this is just what most libertarians do believe, that there is some moral obligation to help some others in dire need. But it is usually up to the individual to follow his conscience as to how far. He continues, those who advocate libertarianism as a theory of duties owed to others typically endorse full interpersonal self-ownership and are subject to this objection. Now, unless we are dealing with mere logical possibilities, the implicit implication here is that in a libertarian society, some people will often need urgent help and not receive it. This is certainly the situation in the non-libertarian world today. State taxes, regulations and restrictions on trade and migration are a large part of the problem. I cannot see how vast numbers of people would be in systematic, dire need in a libertarian society in such a way that charity was completely insufficient and forced transfers would do more good than harm. But suppose I am wrong. If I thought that libertarianism would be a welfare disaster for human beings, then I would not advocate it. There is simply no reason to suppose that I would or am theoretically obliged to insist on liberty though the heavens fall. Nor is it po necessary or possible that I should start making theoretical qualifications or contingency, contingency plans for all the infinitely logical possible disasters. An additional reason here being that this might mislead people into thinking that they are more than logical possibilities. We are told that such libertarians reject any such obligation on the grounds that it induces a form of partial slavery. But taxation, or even occasional coerced assistance, is not partial slavery, and it is hyperbole to regard it as such. It is then stated that those who advocate libertarianism as a theory of enforceable duties, however, need not be subject to this objection. I do not normally express it in this way, but I advocate libertarianism as a, theory, as a theory of enforceable duties, in serious cases at least, namely duties to respect liberty at all times. Presumably, Valentine would object to this in some way. It is not clear what Valentine has in mind here, despite his following explanation. They can endorse full political self-ownership without endorsing full interpersonal self-ownership. The two are the same, except the former is silent about what duties one may owe others, and asserts instead that no one, that one has, sorry, no enforceable duties to aid others, except those that arise from voluntary agreement and prior wrongdoing. <coughs> I can make no clear sense of political self-ownership. What is political about it? And, incidentally, in an article ostensibly explaining libertarianism, why does he not have anything to say about the nature of politics and the state? I cannot see why possible non-enforceable duties are political or why they are not compatible with full interpersonal self-ownership. He continues, of course we could still insist that we have non-voluntary enforceable duties to aid those in extreme need when we can do so at little cost to ourselves. Why leap to the use of aggressive coercion as the first remedy? 
a variety of fully libertarian contractual arrangements would be possible here, such as guarantees of such assistance among all who opt in, or the rules of a private area. And we could also have a variety of fully libertarian punishments. Points of information, sir. Could you put quote unquote when you're quoting it? Sometimes I'm not quite sure where yes. the quote stopping and starting. Okay. It's a bit tedious. Americans do it a lot. It can be useful. Well. I think okay. yeah, yeah, I shall, uh, I'm, I'm sometimes struggling. Every right. time I do that. <laughs> <laughs> that oh, yeah. That's Valentine. That's, that's your reply. <laughs> that's Valentine. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> reply to the request. <clears throat> yes, V for Valentine. <laughs> Having to think about and compete in practice to discover the best ways to promote minimally decent behaviour is more likely to promote uh, that sort of behaviour. The lazy and authoritarian resort to aggressive coercion is, as ever, both illiberal and inefficient. We now come to a second objection. The question is whether others may use the agent's person without her consent to aid those in need. Any time it says her, you can be sure that's not me. <laughs> For example, is it permissible to gently push an innocent agent to the ground in order to save ten innocent lives? Full ownership of both sorts asserts that it is not. In addition to my previous reply, I do not see that libertarianism needs to be interpreted as absolutely proscriptive of all possible proactive impositions or liberty violations. One might even say that, in a sense, proactive impositions are allowed, provided that full restitution is made. If the person in the example above receives full restitution, then who is left to complain that this is not, in the end or overall, libertarian? Perhaps it was temporarily unlibertarian, but the situation was then rectified along libertarian lines. A critic might feel inclined to insist that libertarianism has been abandoned here because it is clear that a violation has taken place. However, that sounds to me to be analogous to someone saying that a football or soccer match was invalid because a foul had taken place, even though the foul was penalised. Both libertarian and football simply include rules for what to do about, in practice, inevitable violations of various sorts. Libertarianism and football are not undermined, but reinforced by such responses. However, the critic might go on to suggest that the analogy is the wrong one. A better analogy would be chess, and here to break the rules is to invalidate the game. You're simply not playing chess if you make an illegal move. But that cannot be right either, for the rules of chess also simply specify the relevant penalties for illegal moves or activities. In a sense, libertarianism, football and chess can be seen as including certain absolute proscriptions and prescriptions, and yet, as they also include rules about how to deal with the violations of the proscriptions and prescriptions, it is clear that the violations do not mean that we have thereby abandoned the game. However, even if this analysis is theoretically flawed in some way, it seems to remain a completely practical solution to the problem posed. Next, a third objection to full self-ownership. That's, that's the second objection is that it includes a right to make gifts of one's services and that such gifts can significantly disrupt the conditions of equality of opportunity. Equality in its various ideological forms is usually regarded as dystopian by libertarians. Equality of opportunity is not even possible and coercive attempts to move towards it destroy, libertarian, to destroy liberty and welfare. Such replies are not discussed by Valentine. And then a fourth objection to full self-ownership is that it permits voluntary enslavement. Of all the things you could object to about libertarianism, you know, <laughs> number four, voluntary enslavement. But this logical possibility is hardly realistic as a serious problem. In any case, self-ownership permits suicide too, and that is far more drastic. 
those who use proactive coercion to prevent voluntary enslavement or suicide are thereby stealing those choices from other people. Choices that, ex ante, and there is no conscious ex post with suicide, <laughs> are preferred by those individuals to the alternatives. Valentine continues. One might, however, reply that the exercise, sorry, that the right to exercise one's autonomy is more fundamental than the protection or promotion of one's autonomy. Yes, one might. But then it looks as though one might be arguing about some sense of autonomy instead, which is usually distinguishable from liberty. It is part of liberty to reject autonomy and be heteronymous if one wishes. Finally, the fifth objection to full self-ownership is that it, like rights in general, can lead to inefficient outcomes where there are externalities or public goods such as police protection. Each person may be better off if some of each person's rights are infringed, e.g. if each person is required to provide service each week on a police patrol. This is a libertarian speaking. He calls himself a libertarian. Given the problems generated by prisoners' dilemmas and other kinds of market failure in large societies, it will typically be impossible to obtain everyone's consent to perform such services. Given the importance of such services, it is arguably permissible to force individuals to provide certain services in violation of full self-ownership, as long as everyone benefits appropriately. All this is mere logical possibility purporting to be the way things really are. It would be irrelevant to rehearse all the arguments and evidence here, but it was coming to see that the state is the problem rather than the solution. That is usually what converted status to libertarianism. So it is either ignorant or disingenuous for someone to suppose that libertarians cannot see or do not care about the alleged inefficiencies of interpersonal liberty. As, you, as we shall see, Valentine later appears to admit uh, genuine force to this criticism. Therefore, he does not appear to be disingenuous. We then go on to two the power of appropriate natural resources, libertarianism, left and right. He begins, one possible view holds that initially, no one has any right, so any liberty right to use or any moral power to appropriate natural resources. In what way is this absence of a liberty right a libertarian possible view? How does this relate to liberty? More precisely, where is the theory of liberty from, from which this result is de derivable and where is the derivation? He continues, a radical version of joint ownership left libertarianism, for example, holds that individuals may use natural resources only with the collective consent. Given that all action requires the use of some natural resources, land, air, etc., this leaves agents no freedom of action except with the permission of others, and this is clearly implausible. It certainly seems quite plausible to me, in the sense that the majority at least would surely consent to a rule that allowed everyone minimal action at least. But what does that joint ownership have to do with liberty? Instead, Valentine suggests a less fat, radical version of joint ownership left libertarianism allows that agents may use natural resources but holds that they have no moral power to appropriate natural resources without the collective consent of the members of society. This is supposed to be libertarianism. It's a version of communism. In an encyclopedia entry on libertarianism. <laughs> Valentine's own criticism is that Although this leaves agents a significant range of freedom of action, it leaves them little security in their plans of action. Suddenly, security is introduced. What has security to do with liberty? Admittedly, the theory is not practical, but it is not impracticality that shows it not to be libertarian. He continues, given the central importance of security of some external resources, it is implausible that agents have no power to appropriate without the consent of others. What does implausible refer to? 
Implausible as being practical? Certainly. Implausible as relating to a theory of left libertarianism? How can we tell without an explicit version of that implicit theory? Maybe it is implausible because left libertarianism is itself implausible. He concludes, a plausible account of liberty rights and powers of appropriation over natural resources must, I claim, be unilateralist. And this sounds prima facie plausible to me as regards a practical theory of interpersonal liberty, but how does it relate to left libertarianism in any way other than some intuition in Valentine's head? Valentine then suggests that additional conditions may include some kind of fair share constraint. So now we're introduced to the notion of a fair share constraint. I'm obliged to ask again, what does this have to do with liberty? As Bishop Butler famously observed, everything is what it is and not another thing. And as Isaiah Berlin rightly pointed out, the notion of the perfect whole, the ultimate solution in which all good things coexists, seems to me not merely unattainable, that is a truism, but conceptually incoherent. Is it not possible that libertarianism, sorry, that liberty is sometimes unfair. And even, tell it not in Gath, publish it not in the streets of Ascalon, that left libertarianism is sometimes unfair. As usual, I'm not so much denying what has been asserted as asking for a philosophical argument that connects apparently distinct things and ultimately to liberty. Valentine goes on accurately to summarize some libertarians views radical right libertarianism holds that there are no fair share constraints on use or appropriation and he points out an apparent problem with these views no human agent created natural resources and there is no reason that the lucky person who first claims rights over a natural resource should reap all the benefits that the resource provided provides nor is there any reason to think that the individuals are morally permitted to ruin or monopolise natural resources as they please. So he sees this as about what is morally permitted rather than what is libertarianly permitted. Hence he concludes categorically that some sort of fair shares condition restricts use and appropriation, when instead he ought to conclude tentatively that some sort of libertarian share condition possibly restricts use and appropriation. Valentine's theory of liberty is not only tacit but conflated with morality. He does not see that two separate questions must be possible here. What does liberty allow? Is liberty morally desirable? He then considers Lockean libertarianism whereby, thanks to the Lockean proviso, enough and as good be left for others. Those who use natural resources or claim rights over them owe compensation to others for any wrongful costs imposed. And again, wrongful ought first to be examined for being illiberal or unlibertarian, especially in an article in, a, in an encyclopedia on libertarianism. Valentine compares this with Nozickian right libertarianism, which interprets the Lockean proviso as requiring that no individual be made off by the use or appropriation of a natural resource compared with non-use or non-appropriation. And Nozick does make some sort of, unfortunately also tacit, libertarian sense. Liberty as such is about the absence of constraints, Interpersonal liberty, in its libertarian sense, is about the absence of uh, initiated impositions or proactive constraints on people by other people, or some equivalent form of words. And other people are not proactively constraining us if they're not making us worse off, at least prima facie. But Valentine's criticism of Nozick here is that one might object that this sets the compensation payment too low. There is little reason, one might argue, to hold that those who first use or claim rights over, natural resource, over a natural resource should reap all the excess benefits that those resources provide. 
One might also object that Valentine's entertained criticism as no apparent connection with liberty. There is, however, an implicit assumption that equality is desirable and that others owe us things that we have in no way produced, as they have done, simply in virtue of our existence. Next, we are offered sufficientarian centrist libertarianism, which sufficientarian centrist libertarianism. This man takes equality <laughs> seriously. I had a choice. This whole article was so awful, I thought, do I refute it in a paragraph or do I just deal with everything? And I suppose yeah. I've, got, I've got, got to work my way through it and just deal with everything and not with it. Sorry. You just don't lose the theory. Anyway, sufficientarian centrist libertarianism, which interprets the lock in proviso as requiring that others be left an adequate share of natural resources on some conception of adequacy. Yet again, what does all this, a sufficient or adequate share of natural resources have to do with liberty? Answer came there, none. He continues, some libertarians, left, left libertarians, argue that it nevertheless fails to recognise the extent to which natural resources belong to all of us in some egalitarian manner. But if it is in an egalitarian manner, how is it libertarian or even compatible with liberty? Answer came there, none. We are then asked to consider equal share left libertarianism, which interprets the Lockean proviso as requiring that one leave an equally valuable share of natural resources for others or compensation. But if people are made no worse off by the propertising of natural resources, or more realistically still made significantly better off, then how have they been relevantly constrained? On the contrary, insisting on an equal share or compensation could interfere with liberty and reduce welfare. Because it is, for the most part, we can imagine extreme cases, a mere logical possibility posing as a real possibility that the propertising as such of natural resources will interfere with interpersonal liberty or human welfare. Though non-libertarian propertising can and does do that. Valentine presses on. Even equal share libertarianism does nothing to offset disadvantages in unchosen internal endowments, e.g. the effects of genes or childhood environments. Equal share libertarianism is thus compatible with radically unequal life prospects. Why is the inequality as such a problem? Why? Is any human suffering or deprivation not the real problem? And why is some combination of free markets primarily, family ties and charity, not a suitable response to the extent that a response is desirable? In any case, how could such inequalities be lessened by the aggressive coercion of politics without both lessening the liberty of some people and setting up a moral hazard that promotes the very thing being objected to? We need to have many kinds of inequality if we are to enjoy prosperity and liberty. Valentine offers only argument by egalitarian bias. And what is this doing in an encyclopedia entry purporting to be about libertarianism? That's the title of the entry, libertarianism. You, you want to find out what libertarianism is? There's the Stanford Encyclopedia is online the main, to explain. Is it the main it's the only entry. Only entry. But Valentine wants us to, to consider then equal opportunity left libertarianism. There are a lot of things you can discuss about <laughs> libertarianism that are very interesting, I think, and controversial, but he goes on and on and on about equality. Equal opportunity left libertarianism. It interprets the Lockean proviso as requiring that one leave enough for others to have an opportunity for well-being that is at least as good as the opportunity for well-being that one obtained in using or appropriating natural resources. But we are reassured individuals are not morally required to provide personal services 
There's a relief. <laughs> or body parts. <laughs> body parts? Uh, because they have more valuable personal endowments. <laughs> I have myself. Why not? Available. Why not? Why stop there? If egalitarianism is desirable, why should self-ownership limit it? He's, he's telling it's desirable, and then he says, oh, we don't worry, we won't get it. Why not? You've, why does equality stop there? There is no theory of liberty to stop it there. Why is any variety of egalitarianism of natural resources a kind of libertarianism? It isn't. This is a mixture of ideologies. Maybe libertarianism is mistaken. It is always relevant to criticise it in any case. And maybe a mixture of ideologies is the right solution, or at least a better solution. But it seems perverse to say that you have a theory of libertarianism when you have admitted to produce any theory of liberty and spend most time discussing different kinds of equality. We then proceed to a very short section on enforced, enforcement rights, prior restraint and rectification. And what follows is a muddle that I shall not analyse because it is trying to do things in terms of mere self-ownership when it ought to be using a theory of liberty. It might help if Valentine had read some of the relevant literature. I will not rehearse the arguments here. The fourth section is on anarchism and the minimal state. Valentine outlines the general libertarian theory and then goes on to argue, left libertarians can endorse certain state-like activities, form organizations that under certain conditions could force individuals to give them the payment they owe for their rights over natural resources and also provide various public goods such as basic police services, nat national defence, roads, parks and so on. As already discussed, funding by so-called left libertarian methods is an egalitarian presumption unrelated to liberty. Moreover, setting aside national defence for a moment, police services, roads, parks and so on are simply and clearly not public goods as economics uses the expression. They are rivalrous in consumption and providers can exclude non-payers. So why should the market not provide them? Maybe it shouldn't, but he doesn't explain. Nor are there, anarcho-libertarians would argue, any significant public goods. In theory, a case for national defence being a public good can be made, but in practice, the state versions of it generate more warmongering problems than they offer any real defensive solutions. And even if there were significant public goods, there are various ways they might be dealt with in a libertarian manner without leaping to taxation by another name and state-like activities. All this is discussed in the libertarian literature which is a necessary background, one might have supposed, to writing an encyclopedia entry on libertarianism. Section five is listed as some ancillary issues. There are in fact only two issues. The first being, what is the status of non-autonomous beings, such as children and many animals, that have moral standing because sentient? Valentine suggests that one possible reply is to deny that there are any non-autonomous beings with moral standing, and another possibility is to hold that non-autonomous sentient beings are full self-owners, this being Valentine's own preference, apparently. Mice own themselves. Uh, but he says that this relates to interests and not choices. Again, there is much confusion here by trying to do everything in terms of self-ownership, self-ownershipism, instead of liberty, libertarianism. I do not see any baffling philosophical problem. Full liberty is primarily for full adult persons, in the intellectual sense of persons. Paternalism applies to children to varying degrees, fading away in proportion as they approach adulthood. With animals, by contrast, there is a duty of common decency not to inflict gratuitous suffering. But this is completely unrelated to libertarianism, let alone self-ownership. Libertarianism, or classical liberalism, is for people, not jellyfish 
or aardvarks or even bonobo chimpanzees. The second issue is listed as historical principles and the real world. In particular, we have little knowledge of the specific rights violations that took place in the past. Thus, we have little knowledge of what justice today requires. And yet, Valentine admits that we should simply make our best judgment about what is just based on what we know. So that hardly seems a particular problem for libertarianism compared to any other ideology. And he also notes that after, after the passage of enough time, the right of rectification for a specific libertarian pa uh, specific past rights violation may cease to be valid. But he thinks, it's not clear, however, that there is a plausible, principled libertarian justification for such a statute of limitations. A mere time limit would indeed be arbitrary, but there are clear libertarian reasons for limiting claims if one only has a theory of liberty. As time passes, or more precisely, as relevant information is lost, we eventually cannot have any plausible case for calculating what amount of libertarian restitution might be owed by whom to whom. And the disruption that would be caused by enforcing restitution based on unfalsifiable speculations and generalizations would itself proactively impose on the living far more than it rectifies any previous imposition in the past. Of course, each case needs to be dealt, on its own, dealt with on its own merits, and there may be, well be some clear cases, especially as regards the inheritance of specific objects that are traceable and rectifiable after very many generations. In section six, we reach Valentine's conclusion that Libertarianism is attractive because, one, it provides significant moral liberty <laughs> of action. Two, it, provoke, it provides significant moral protection against interference from others. And three, it is sensitive to what the past was like, e.g. what agreements were made and what rights violations took place. Now, if you are a justificationist rather than a critical rationalist, more on this later, then you are thereby bound to look for reasons to support your theories, including such things as Valentine's three-point list. But if you are a mainstream libertarian, then how could you possibly overlook the bounty that flows from free markets? in an encyclopedia entry, introducing people to libertarianism. However, this is, in any case, an irrelevant list of desirable things that could, in principle, be extended indefinitely or simply reduced to because it maximizes liberty. It is much more pertinent when Valentine writes, critically, that libertarianism faces, however, the serious objection that it gives too much protection from interference and not enough attention to making the future better, e.g. by meeting people's basic needs, making people's lives go better, or promoting equality. More pertinent, but more ignorant. He has given us no sound example to show that libertarianism gives too much protection from interference, nor has he shown that it does not make people's meet people's basic needs or make people's lives go better and only a non-libertarian misanthrope could think there is virtue in promoting equality as such to do this there is no need to help the worse off just destroy more than proportionate wealth of the better off and you are promoting equality <laughs> valentine finishes with what is probably intended to be an anodyne, undogmatic and uncontroversial assertion that the overall assessment of libertarianism is a matter of ongoing debate. But this is more like dogmatic agnosticism that appeals to the democratic theory of truth, or at least assessment. 
The factual theses of libertarianism are either true or false, and the moral theses are either right or wrong. It is my individual conjecture that libertarianism is true and right. Valentine has written no sound criticism of that conjecture, nor has he shown that libertarianism requires any kind of egalitarianism. This encyclopedia, Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy Online, needs to have an entry that concentrates on libertarianism or classical liberalism without any uh, varieties of ideologically distinct prefix or suffix libertarianism uh, or having them as separate entries. Finally, and very briefly, we come to Matt Zwolinski's Internet Encyclopedia of Philosophy entry on libertarianism. I will ignore the various pro-statist errors and criticisms that I have already dealt with in my reply to Valentine. Zwolinski begins. I can't do as it. <laughs> what it means to be a libertarian is a contentious issue, especially among libertarians themselves. There is no single theory that can be safely identified as the libertarian theory, and probably no single principle or set of principles on which all libertarians can agree. Thus, Zwolinski appears to err in the opposite direction to Valentine's strict sense of libertarianism. Is it really so completely contentious? What about liberty itself? Is it not agreed, at least at a meta-theoretical level, that the theory that has to be ultimately that the theory has to be ultimately and only about interpersonal liberty and in some non-interference sense that most libertarians would recognize? And is not liberty the single principle on which all libertarians ought to agree, at least in principle, or how are they libertarians? Zwolinski does mention liberty understood as non-interference, but merely bundles it with a rough agreement on a cluster of normative principles, empirical generalizations, and policy recommendations. I do not mean to be flippantly vacuous here. My point is that interpersonal liberty itself must be primary, and any theory that cannot be understood in terms of interpersonal liberty is not really a libertarian theory at all, but something else. For instance, something that makes self-ownership primary might be better known as self-ownershipism unless we can somehow show that self-ownership is completely identical with or equivalent to liberty. But then you still need a theory of liberty. Zwolinski then writes of so-called anarcho-capitalists. There is indeed a problem with this name, but he does not spell it out. As capitalist institutions are not compulsory or universal with libertarianism, it might be more accurate to call them private property anarchists. On the basis of private property anarchism, charity is an option and so is communism, at least in families and small communities. We're then told, on the other hand, are those who generally identify themselves as classical liberals. And these people are more willing to allow greater room for coercive activity on the part of the state and so to allow, say, state provision of public goods or even limited tax-funded welfare transfers. But many self-styled libertarians fit this description in my, my experience. And there were some early classical liberals who were anarchists. Moreover, they all used the same cluster of ideological arguments. So there does appear, so I beg your pardon, so there does not appear to be a coherent or consistent theoretical or sociological distinction to be made here. Libertarianism just is the modern word for classical liberalism, or rather liberalism, as it was originally called. We then start section one, the diversity of libertarian theories. And we are told that libertarianism is a theory about the proper role of government. I beg to differ. It is primarily a social theory about the desirability of interpersonal liberty. Naturally, this has consequences for politics, but the proper role of government is not the focus. Interpersonal liberty is the focus. The clue is in the word libertarianism. Only people who want governments think it is really about governments. 
apparently libertarianism can be and has been supported on a number of different metaphysical, epistemological and moral grounds. Oh dear. The critical rationalist epistemology and the possibility of critical rationalist libertarianism thereby appears to have been entirely overlooked. For by critical rationalism, which is not mentioned anywhere in almost 14,000 words, theories are not supported on any grounds, not even critical rationalist grounds. So an entire epistemological approach is completely omitted from this encyclopedia entry on libertarianism, which, even if it did not happen to be the correct epistemological approach, is an egregious error. He goes on to list various justificationist approaches. This is not by any means a waste of time. For as I have often noted, many so-called justifications are better viewed and completely valid as different kinds of explanations of aspects of how things are, if factual or ought to be, if moral. An explanation is another kind of unjustifiable but possibly true theory. If true, they are not merely valid but sound explanations. However, they remain conjectures. Zralinsky says his article will focus almost exclusively on libertarian arguments regarding just two philosophical subjects, distributive justice and political authority. However, he thinks that this is in accord with the philosophic literature on libertarianism, and his article is a summary of that literature. After discussing the various main attempts to find a justification or foundations for libertarianism, we finally come to his conclusion. Libertarianism as an overlapping consensus. And here he criticises the whole foundationalist approach because anyone who disagrees with one's philosophic foundations will not be much persuaded by one's conclusions drawn from them. And he goes on to observe, as a result, much of the most interesting work in contemporary libertarian theory skips systematic theory building altogether and heads straight to the analysis of concrete problems. Zwolinski has stumbled onto something like critical rationalist libertarianism without realizing that this is what he has done. He continues, often this analysis proceeds by, by accepting some set of values as given, often the values embraced by those who are not sympathetic, sympathetic to libertarianism as a political theory, and showing that libertarian political institutions will better realize those values than, completing, than competing institutional frameworks. Besides Daniel uh, Shapiro, Lawrence Lamas Lamaski and David uh, Schmitz in a variety of ways. And with justificationist language and errors expanded, it, it expunged, all of the arguments that he cites have their counterparts uh, in libertarianism. There is, however, a crucial mistake in, in Zwolinski's thinking that this approach cannot be applied equally to all political uh, philosophical theory. For political philosophy does not need to aim for theoretical completeness or complete agreement on comprehensive moral theories, as he thinks. It is enough for political philosophers to conjecture a theory and then reply to specific criticisms and criticise inconsistent theories. Zwolinski clearly shows that he has not seen that so-called justifications or foundations as such are the problems, but he claims to know where there are, where, yes, to know where a theoretical justification of this approach can be found. And there is a further irony in that he thinks he finds it in John Rawls' notion of an overlapping consensus concluding that libertarianism with its robust toleration of individual differences seems well suited to serve as a foundation for such a framework. I argued exactly this point and in favour of full libertarian anarchy in the final chapter of Escape from Leviathan, which was uh, itself previously published in 1996 in the anthology for and against the state, and first written 25 years ago in criticism of Rawls' original 1987 article. 
In conclusion then, if philosophers were to write accounts of libertarianism, or if they are to write accounts of libertarianism, they would do better not to neglect two things in particular. One, libertarian theories of interpersonal liberty, and two, critical rationalist libertarianism. However, I also want to mention three, the classical liberal compatibility thesis. There are no systematic, theoretical, or practical clashes when it comes to maximizing human liberty and human welfare. And I mention this bold conjecture because I think it is true and because it entails that we do not in need to engage in a trade-off between the two biggest des desiderata of moral and political theory. If only there were a book that uh, deals with all three <laughs> about to come out in paperback. <laughs> By remarkable coincidence, Escape from Leviathan deals with these three points and is about to be published in paperback by the University of Buckingham Press on May the 1st. Thank you. Oh. <laughs> Everyone got chairman? Can I do anything? <laughs> Why May the 1st? It's Labour Day. <laughs> Beginning. Edging, you've got to edge the socialists out. So, to, you know, this is Libertarian Day. Is that really the only other? That's what the publisher told me. No, no. Oh, I mean, sorry, sorry, what? No, I mean, this Wikipedia thing. Uh, this, isn't, this, is, what, this isn't Wikipedia. No, no, no. If it was only Wikipedia, you could ignore it or change oh, it. Oh, no, this is the what's it? Yes, yes. yes. This is the Stanford yes, Encyclopedia yes, yes. of I, Philosophy, I of which is a uh, fairly respectable Stanford University. It's, it's, what is it? It's Ivy League, I think, isn't it? Uh, uh, okay, and the online encyclopedia, which is... But why is he pushing his own view? Why not just quote other people? <sighs> well, they could be all happening themselves. Yeah, I mean, the, I mean the, it's a bit of a mystery. I, was, I mean, I, I think the honest thing to have done, I'm not necessarily saying he, would, he is dishonest, but... The sensible thing, anyway, to have done is say, well, look, I have a particular line, and uh, this is all the mainstream stuff. Can I have a separate entry on left libertarianism, please? Yeah, yeah. Instead, 90% of it is on so-called left libertarianism. And all of the interesting questions that might arise about ordinary mainstream libertarianism, hardly any of them get asked or answered. Uh, uh, and I just read this, and I just thought, this is, this is scandalous, really. Just scandalous. Somebody needs to write an attack on this uh, article. Sadly, I knew who that person was. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Valentine. He's a, he's, a, he's, a, he's, um, he's a notorious academic. Uh, he's, I mean, he's writes books and articles on left libertarianism all the time. I apologise for this. Everybody, uh, I mean, it's quite well known. Uh, uh, for, for specialising, oh yes, oh yeah, mm. yeah. I mean, Zwinski is not quite so high profile in uh, uh, academic terms, but Zwinski is uh, the moving force behind bleeding heart libertarianism. Oh, I thought it was a good thing until I. Oh. Well, uh, I've been read, I've read a lot of their articles recently. On, uh, uh, the thing is, they, they they define bleeding heart libertarianism in such a way that I have to say, well, if it's that vague, okay, I'm a bleeding. You know, if 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 the free market were a disaster, would you be against it? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm a bleeding. Uh, I would be. Uh, so uh, that, that makes. But then they so then they jump from that to saying, so how much of a welfare state do we need? Where did that come from? I don't see. I don't see how you get from <laughs> the logical possibility that the free market could be a welfare disaster to therefore we have to guarantee a certain welfare state of a certain sort. But that's his area, and that's what he specialises in. That's fair enough. But he should put his own name to it. I mean, I know he has. Yeah. He say, this is my view. Not, yeah. This is libertarian. Yeah. I mean, I mean, I mean to be fair, Zwolinski's article. Uh, actually does go through all the different kinds and, and says there's this and this, except critical rationalism, doesn't get a look in, of course. 
no, uh, over in America. In fact, uh, Mark Brady sent him an email recently on Bleeding Heart Libertarianism this, uh, where he's been talking about justifying this and justifying that. And he says, I, say, I have a problem with justification. He says, I just don't understand what you mean. <laughs> How can you possibly have a problem with justification? And, and, and a couple of people said, well, you know, critical rationalism. And, uh, it, in America, it doesn't, it doesn't, the penny has, doesn't drop at all. They, just, they, don't, they don't like it. It doesn't help the libertarians can't abide proper anyway, mostly. I mean, mm. American ones. Yeah. So you're, you're sort of sort of Paul. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> Perhaps one can detect a whiff, just a whiff, of essentialism in your criticism of yeah. uh, Valentine's uh, encyclopedia entry. Mm. Um, in that, yeah, libertarianism doesn't have to be just about interpersonal liberty. But, but, the words aren't, yeah, they're, they're etymologically related. Uh, and I agree with you, Tom. What you say about, you know, things are what they are, they're not other things. Mm. But the point is, you know, libertarianism is, it's certainly in the academic world, more than just what the more currently high profile people who are calling themselves libertarians, it's more than just a Rothbard and Cato Institute that oh, yeah. tend to see it as. Uh, and certainly, they're not, they tend not to be as well organised. And it's probably true to say that the, the biggest, the, there is a huge uh, group of academics calling themselves left, left libertarians. Valentine is one of the most yeah. famous ones. The other most famous published one is uh, Philip Van Parry yes. with his uh, Real Freedom for All book. Mm. Uh, somebody called uh, Ots, Michael Otsuka, who wrote a book called Libertarianism yeah. Without Inequality. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. Uh, there are quite a few of them around with this line. They want to call themselves libertarians. I have no objection. And, and their view is that they're, 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 and it is, as you say, a melange of, sort of they, they want to sort of have communism but without the oppression. Mm. So, they take freedom, interpersonal freedom, rather more seriously than that, yeah. perhaps, you can tell from their writings. And, uh, <clears throat> and there are very, very strategic and you know, alliances with uh, more right libertarians. But it's also not quite the case. There's at least, I think, five or six conceptually different theories or views, calling itself left libertarianism. Mm. There's the Malentine on Sucas Philip Pampery's yeah. mob. There's Rod Long's mob, which he's yeah. sort of in with the bleeding heart libertarian. The, the famous folk porn star, Rod Long. Rod Long, oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and they're, they're very different. They're not at all interested in uh, the kind of uh, material equality. Yeah. They, they, they want to, they want to, they, they think that full, and that's sort of Rod Long and Charles Johnson and, um, Fellow you ranked people, uh, yeah, okay. uh, Paul Marshall, Carson. Kevin Carson, yeah. Carson. yeah. Carson. They, they, they tend to take a view that's more sort of mutualist uh, to some extent in the economy, but they're, they're, they're looking more, they think that a free market properly understood on full libertarian, full libertarian yeah. lines yeah. Would, will bring about more equality, but they're also very concerned about the modern PC notions like sexism and mm. homophobia and anti racism and that yeah. kind of thing. They've got this idea of thick libertarianism. Oh, yeah. So there's those people. There's um, Conkey, Samuel Conkey the third, I think he was called before he died. Um, What's he called he's now? He's still called now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Dead. Dead. Deceased. Yeah. Deceased. Deceased. Yeah. Uh, he uh, he saw himself as more of a kind of, and he used libertarianism, uh, left libertarianism, to mean counterculture tactics and strategies, yeah. sort of yeah, opting out of the state and setting up your own. Sort of, uh, so it's more of a kind of strategic thing. So there's, there's a whole slew of different types of uh, mm. left oh, of views parading as left libertarianism, but they tend not to be the academic. Well, the main academic view called left libertarianism mm. is, is Valentine's thing, and they, they just simply want the name the same as we do. And it's, if you ask Valentine to write a, a, an encyclopedia essay on libertarianism, you're going to write about both. And um, your, your criticisms of it are quite right. You know, what's it to do with liberty? You know, the ball, he's got all these concepts that are not connected. He doesn't connect them in any way. Mm. And there's all sorts of things wrong with them. You, but uh, to say it's just not about liberty, I think mean, he's a touch essentialist. Right? Well, I, I, I am a touch essentialist. I mean, <laughs> in the sense that, for it's instance, for, uh, 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 let's take physical science, for instance. If somebody says, um, I'm a sun scientist, I specialise in the sun, and you know how it came about and how it works and sunspots and so on. and then you find he's looking up at the moon at night <laughs> and you say sorry that's the moon 
and you, you are pure essentialism. No, no. The moon is the moon, and the sun is the sun, and you can't just say you're studying that, and that's what you're calling the sun. It just—it's just nonsense. I mean, it's just—it makes everything you say ridiculous. So, if you're going to say that you're interested in liberty, all I ask. Not that you embrace any particular theory of liberty, but at least have some liberty. theory. <laughs> Don't just say, I'm a libertarian, so we should all be equal, shouldn't we? Where does it come from? Just, I mean, I'm not saying you can't do it, but just, just show me the connection. Show me how that is actually really libertarian. I am, um, no matter how bad your argument is, I won't complain. I won't complain. The fact is you've tried, you think you're a libertarian, that's enough. Or, or that, uh, so I'm only that much of a whiff uh, that, 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 that you can't just words cannot be just yeah, mean anything or nothing or. I mean, the, the best solution in the encyclopedia would be a lot, separate entries. It's, it's, it's have lots of separate entries. Yes. And a lot, a lot more separate entries. Instead of so libertarianism, is if you're going to get something like Valentine's right, it's, it's to, uh, if you had somebody like you writing it, you would have to be the Valentine's saying, "Well, what's all this to do with with Arby?" So a lot of separate entries would have been the solution. It's, it's too big a concept. It's probably bigger than the encyclopedia compilers were thinking when they... But you see, it wouldn't, you, it, 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 the whole thing is about 16,000 words or something. It's yeah. enormous. Yeah. I mean, he could easily have said, OK, there's Nazikians, Rabardians, and just gone through... And now, sure. that's more or less what sure. Valentine did. Mm. You know, except they didn't mention the critical rationalists, of course, because that doesn't mean anything over there. Popper is not a big thing in America, unfortunately. Exactly. Yeah. Point of somewhat dull interest. I mean, the late Michael Foote described himself as a libertarian, and there are different means of libertarian, which some hang on to. There's the um, there's the free will libertarian. Yes. Oh, I didn't there's mean the, that. Um, the libertine <laughs> shack around, but you're not doing any harm to anyone. He probably meant social. He meant yeah. sexually, drugs. You know that <laughs> that's all. Age, probably not. Uh, and he's but he meant, I think he meant free speech. Free speech. By which he meant you're forced to listen to certain things and you're not allowed to listen to other no, things. No, he was quite good on free speech, Michael Foote. Did you Bugger all else. Yeah. He, Bugger he, all else, but he was quite good on free he will have wanted, He will have wanted democracy as part of libertarianism. What? Compulsory democracy? Oh, yes, he, 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 he won't have realised. I mean, Michael Foote, I mean, I, don't, I might be wrong, I might be getting him wrong, but I don't think so. I think he'll have thought there's no clash between democracy and libertarianism, oh, no. which is exactly what Judge Stuart Mill thought until Alexis Tuffield pointed out to him the clash. And of course James Mill didn't thought of it as well. The, the most absurd Labour politician to call consistently keep calling himself a libertarian is Roy Hattersley. Oh yeah. Who, 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 who yeah. describes himself as a libertarian all the time, usually yes. in the context, I'm a hard libertarian, but <laughs> I now want to propose status solution X, Y, and Z of to, to my open being my volunteers. Is the, the, there is a possibility that there are lots of socialists bailing out. I mean, wanting another word. Mm. They haven't changed much, but they've realised that socialism, socialist, has bad connotation. Well, and of course, that's and what, the, and that's what the, uh, the RCP and their current guys... Ah of the Institute of Ideas and whatever. Uh, a sound bunch of, of yeah. conservative free now, They are. I mean, to some extent, they are, I mean, they are libertarian on social issues. Yeah. And, of course, there's a sense in which the more that they use the word, it's, it's, That's good. It, it's good, because yeah. then we, you can just correct them and say, well, it's still quite right. The right I mean, I'm afraid, you see, that they're... Um, what, what they're doing is they're, they're, they're putting out all this libertarian stuff without realising that the, the next generation really is going to be libertarian and they're going to reject the non-libertarian stuff and actually be libertarian, so it's going to play... Well, one thing we should be thankful for in the current political climate is that David Cameron has declared himself an avowed enemy of libertarianism. Oh, he? Oh, yes. Good. So he says he's not... Because he surely is. He's, he's, well, he says I'm that very libertarianism sad to is say. nonsense, it's rubbish. He's, he, said, he said, I'm not a libertarian, I'm not interested in all this libertarian claptrap. He said these things on many occasions, which is good. Because the last thing we want is him pretend, pretending to pass himself off as a libertarian. Sadly, <laughs> uh, Boris Johnson uh -oh. told me... Yeah, yeah when he was introduced to me, that he is a libertarian. Yes. <laughs> so, I, so... I understand so, Boris Johnson has a brother who claims to be an anarcho-capitalist, actually. Uh, is he? David uh, knows him a bit more. Uh, 
Boris Johnson, does he not have a brother who claims to be an anarcho capitalist? That's <laughs> 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 not true. I'll tell you where I heard it from. It was from that Andy, and, Andy Duncan, who knows for a job quite well and lives in Henley with him and things like that. Probably. Yeah. 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 Peter Haynes, thanks for the idea. He's in the quaint, uh, old fashioned. Peter Haynes. Sort of sense. <laughs> free speech, free free goes from, he goes from South Africa. He doesn't believe in free association, that's for sure. Well, <laughs> well, 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 well. Um, I should, should say, as a way of introduction, I actually uh, know Matt Zwilinski. I was at university with him in uh, Arizona for a couple of years. Yeah. And um, the um, sort of teaching philosophy there. You told him all he knew, did you? <laughs> 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 he tried to. More of the uh, sort of uh, more robust and libertarian ideas that occasionally appear in the footnotes. <laughs> but um, I remember in a class with um, Gordon Tullock and going around the room, and Gordon was sort of asking, you know, what should sort of government do? And uh, Matt said, not very much, and I said, even less. Um, and, um, but, but philosophy in Arizona is very, uh, very much sort of analytical philosophy, very, very dry. There's a lot of Kankian influence there. You also got Julianne as um, a um, scholar on sort of, um, the quite um, sort of, uh, Plato and um, Aristotle. So it's a very interesting sort of um, environment to be in. And coming out of that, I think that if you look at the um, sort of parts of uh, Matt's essay, which is to do with more about the um, sort of basically society working a bit more together. That actually is probably the more interesting element as you get to the sort of conclusion of this overlapping consensus, which I don't quite buy the argument that we're making. But the I think the the idea is it's not just liberty between people that we're concerned with. I think we also need to be talking about the idea about um, individuals being or needing the sort of sustenance of a wider society around them. But just the focus upon sort of the um, interpersonal liberty side of things doesn't actually get us to answers around what um, is appropriate um, structures in society. Um, and if you look at the stuff that he talks about, uh, references the, the um, theological groundings of um, libertarianism, such as um, the sort of the near Aristotelian writings of Rasmus and Dr. Nile, they're saying, well, What's required for human beings to flourish and to survive and so on is that wider sort of, um, social nexus, so, social arrangement, social institutions, which if you then come back to the sort of talk about interpersonal liberty, that becomes the, the requirement for sort of political liberalism, the sort of um, structure of how we interrelate to other people. But I think that's actually something that needs to be further looked at, both in his paper, but also in your critique that you're offering up onto it, because to make it more, it, a little bit clearer about what is required, because I don't think we just sort of simply sit in an armchair and say, all of these are decisions, how you solve them. Actually, those things are decided by people getting together and making decisions. Sometimes those are good or bad decisions, but those institutions, those customs and norms are important ways to solve those issues. So I think that needs to be explored a bit more. Except that, I mean, after, going through this long list of justifications or foundations, in the end he says none of them work. So he rejects them all himself and says we've got to look at real problems. Well, in fact, if you look at the argument about theological um, libertarianism, mm. actually you can go from that, you can actually argue uh, through sort of various writings in sort of legal philosophy like Ron Fuller to actually a pretty much a narco-capitalist regime. So you could actually get to the anarcho-capitalist type argument at a reasonably easy pace that's consistent with that kind of theological background. That's actually ruled out from his own, own, own approach here. Mm. So I think there's a lot more, and that also binds into your point about um, markets actually not being welfare disaster and so on. Mm. Actually, if you've got sort of markets of working and correctly, then you're going to actually get loads of stuff produced, you're going to solve issues around welfare quite easily and those people left over is going to be a much easier case to solve than um, what we think at the moment. I, 
I actually think within a couple of decades, you could take any society and achieve stratospheric levels of welfare if you just stop the government spending half of everything that's produced. And that's what happened with Korea, for instance. Um, it is allowed for a philosopher not to be an economist or an historian or a political theorist. Or, I mean, you are allowed to simply say, this is this and this is this, my view, yeah. and make of it what you can. Well, surely you're allowed to do that. Um, sorry, why, what, why, what have I said? That well, I mean, uh, why should you have to say, oh, by the way, uh, the policy political implications are such and such, or economical implications are such and such, or you're simply saying what liberty is. Yeah, well, I mean, that's one part of the simplicity of critical rationalism is uh, uh, you don't have to give long, involved explanations. You simply say, what's wrong with leaving people alone? And then you deal with the ideas as they come in. You don't have to... Uh, I mean, you can explain if you wish, and if they, are, if they are asked, if they say, I just don't understand how the market could possibly give people lots of goodies, then you can give them an explanation. But that won't be a justification, that will just be a conjectural explanation. Of course, as a matter of biography, you, you may have read all around the subject and know what's going to come from liberty, but you're not obliged to put it in mm. when you talk about liberty. Mm. Yeah, um, yeah. Five or six years ago, I was the American Philosophical Association, and Doug Rasmussen uh, was uh, speaking. Uh, he was he'd written a new book. Well, same like book. the eighth version. The eighth version. <laughs> the eighth version of the book is he always writes with <laughs> a different title. Uh, um, <laughs> no, it's not. It could be true. Like, could be McCann, who's written the twenty ninth version of the same book. <laughs> Um, but it was written about the eighth version of, of, of his book, and he was defending it uh, to a, uh, a room of philosophers, uh, mainly of students, uh, mostly. Um, and uh, he gave his usual justification that you know, libertarianism is good because it leads to human flourishing. And I sort of sat and listened to all the criticisms coming from the floor, and they were all the criticisms were basically raising various logical possibilities mere logical possibilities of why uh, liberty wouldn't lead to human flourishing. And mm. Doug was flailing around trying to answer these, not doing terribly well. And uh, to, to listen to this for about an, an hour, I chipped in and pinched your classical liberal compatibility thesis and just said, well, I think what Doug's trying to say is that um, there is no plausible clash between yeah, implogically. Liberty, yeah, logically, between, could, between liberty and human yeah. no plausible systematic clash between liberty and human flourishing. Mm -hmm. And unless I said none of these I said unless you can actually come up with a real plausible example yeah. of a systematic clash, then Doug's thesis uh, for, the, for the purposes of this meeting remains unrefuted. Yeah. And he came up he thought I was a genius. If I scratch my nose, he said, said well make up to it. Easy. <laughs> I mean, we can we can we can give a lot of lib classical, sorry, um, critical rationalist kind of arguments to people, and, mm. and they're really happy to receive them as long as you don't explain. Yeah, no, I was, the, I was, the, your epistemology behind it. They say, no, yeah, I, no I, I, I don't know. That's very flippantly yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, you mustn't mention the P word. Or... No. Yeah. <laughs> um, you you talked a lot about morals mm. and uh, the confusion between liberty and morals, and yeah. moral theory and political theory that often arises. And it's, a, it's an easy mistake to make uh, because th there is an intimate connection between libertarianism and morality. Uh, but it's not that you know, one is the other or one is justified by the other or one or the other. Um, I think the, uh, the, the, the connection between libertarianism and morality is, in, is that you know, the correct moral theory is respecting libertarian autonomy. Mm. Uh, that is, what morality is, what normative morality is, some sorts of other false ideas about what it is, but in fact that's actually what it is. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, that's, that's that's my theory that I defend, uh, and uh, so I think I think yeah, it is intimately connected. I mean, I, I would always, I would certainly defend liberty, libertarianism as a moral theory. I yeah. just that I I just insist that 
that you can separate what liberty is mm. from the fact that it's yeah. morally desirable. Yeah. And some people don't seem able to do that. Mm. And, that and, 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 and as you say, and, and in lots of writing, you know, yeah, what, what morality is, you have all these, uh, lots of libertarians writing about morality. But they, it's clear that they have no uh, properly thought out moral theory that they're trying to, they're just making it up as they go along. You know, they're, just, it's just, it's just, they're just using the word morals and morality in a, in a common sense sort of sense or a Pickwickian sense or you know, it's just the word they fling in from time to time to obscure things and that. There's, there's, you, can, it's, you can't detect any, uh, yeah. any that they've got, you can't detect that they've got any kind of moral theory. And a lot of them say things like um, libertarianism allows you to do all kinds of immoral things. <laughs> Uh, you know, it just it allows you to do all kinds of immoral things, like uh, acquire vast amounts of wealth. Some of them might say, like Rod Long might say something like that, you know, or or some, somebody like Hopper or Block might say, libertarianism allows you to do all sorts of terrible and immoral things, like uh, be a homosexual or you know, or. Um, I didn't realise it was that bad. <laughs> <laughs> you want to blight? Thinking about it again. Yeah. yeah. Or, 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 or fail to be a Christian or something, things yeah. like this, you know. But it's, yeah, they're just. They're just chucking in various ad hoc common sense yeah. uses of the word morality, yeah. uh, as either as crowd pleasers or whatever else. But, but, but it never occurs to anyone to try and think seriously about morals or what the connection between liberty and morality is uh, before they pipe up on it. Mm. I, th I think, quite simply, that people know that liberty is a good thing and human welfare is a good thing. Therefore, uh, whatever produces human welfare is liberty. Now that means socialist uh, directors from above and being told what to do. Well, uh, uh, that must be liberty because it, it, it gives you goodness, it gives you uh, welfare. Mm. Therefore, uh, what's the problem? Because they, they think think they ought to connect. They think true liberty must lead to true happiness. Now it may do so, but you're separating the, the two out. But yeah, I mean, I. Uh... I can see how uh, we could sort of end up agreeing, but for completely different reasons, <laughs> uh, with somebody who took that approach. I'd want, I'd want there to be, I'd, I, I like it to be conceptually possible that liberty could be a disaster, uh, and uh, and that, that uh, you know the idea that they have to go together is just. I'd like to hear, that would be a very good argument to show that they necessarily go together. Yeah. Oh, it's not an argument, they just yeah. think that yeah. there's a, think a, there is that assumption. These are the good things, yeah. must require liberty, yeah. but as they define it. Yeah. David? I'm not sure who I'm agreeing or disagreeing with, <laughs> but uh, I think we had this debate uh, three or four years ago, but I think that, I think it, it, it's implicit in the compatibility thesis. Yeah. But actually, there is a very deep logical connection between maximal liberty and maximal welfare. There's a conceptual connection well, and an empirical well, connection. I, 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 I can't quite lay my whatever normally lays on things on it, but there has to be because oh, it, yeah. it, it would be the most bizarre coincidence that it just so happens that the biggest pile of liberty equates with the biggest pile of welfare. Out of all the possible permutations of how much liberty and how much welfare, the fact that the most liberty equates with the most welfare, if that's true, it, 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 it can't be a coincidence. It is not a coincidence. Then there has to be some really deep beats of why the one leads to the other. Well, the things like think... liberty leads to responsibility and prudence and it avoids moral hazard. And I mean, there are all sorts of explanations as to how they will go together and um i think it is a coincidence you know but we're so used to the factual outcome that we tend to think that it's not just a coincidence in other words we could imagine a twin earth which had different properties yeah. uh, and it, it, there liberty would probably be dysfunctional no, it's, Actually, i can't imagine it still, I, can't. I, I cannot see <laughs> i cannot see how it could be a coincidence it just seems to be that bizarre. Well, uh, well, with 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 a different intelligent species on another planet, for instance, like the me. Borg or whatever. Like it, yeah, it just maybe. Well, then it's a bizarre coincidence that 
libertarianism works for humans. It's not, it's not, no, well, it's like, it's like the anthropocentric principle that it's bizarre that the universe is just yeah. right. Yeah. Well, Ants will be, ants will be different. Yeah. Whoa, what, 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 what does that show? Uh, well, that is quite a difficult question. As a well, dictionary, Mr. Chairman, coincidence means coincidence. It doesn't mean a fluke or a chance. It just yeah. means yeah. they both come at the same time. Yeah. And multiple, it's not, not bizarre, it's just a no. fact. It's a, it's a fact of reality. It's no more than granted, it's a fact of reality that we've noticed. And that we've noticed and uh, extrapolated and theorised about it. Uh, it's like, yeah, it, it, it might be, as you just said, it might be that sort of, you know, fast, you know, like autocratic you. authoritarianism leads to the best thing if, if you have a borg like race and like that. Mm. But and if that was systematically always the case, then we, it, we would say, I have to imagine you could think anything else. Well, yeah, it's, it's just what you're saying, in a, in, there, it's put, what you're saying in, in, from the opposite point of view, so isn't it remarkable that uh, everybody can't just become richer by stealing from each other? <laughs> is, that remar is that remarkable? Yeah, is, is it, is it, it's remarkable that they actually have to produce things and, uh, and, and, and sell them, and then uh, with the, uh, and they both sides gain because they both get that. Oh, that's completely remarkable. It, doesn't, it just doesn't, if, once you look into it, it's not remarkable because all the explanations are there. Sorry, but I'm not saying it's a coincidence. I'm saying that the two are inextricably linked. That, 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 that oh. There are very deep reasons why liberty does, why maximum liberty does promote. Well, partly, but yeah, but partly because we, like, we like uh, doing uh, things without being told what to do. I mean, I, I want to see this film, not that film. That you know, I don't want to be told what film to watch. I mean, uh, I, I want to. I mean, in that sense, it's sort of natural that you that you uh, getting what you want, which is part of liberty. Yeah, I see that. You know, so there's yeah, and I, and I suppose a more. We, we can, as I said, we can imagine. Well, that's, uh, partly, it's because the terms are defined on within another as well. There is that. When we say maximising welfare, we mean we don't just yeah. mean for the leader. Well, they may be. <laughs> we mean they for may be to enjoy. tautologically coincident in the sense that one might say, there well, actually, that, yeah. part of what you're defining as welfare is about liberty, because if if you get more of what you want, if a lot of what you want to do what you want to do as much as you can, and then it necessarily follows that a large chunk of welfare will be liberty. But I think there's even more to it than that. I think actually the, the, the but, but, but it applies because because humans are what they are. If we were magical beings and we could just create things by thinking about it, you know, then it perhaps we would apply. Well, if we were ants, and if we were ants, but we are. We're humans. That's right. This is the, this is this is the way humans are psychologically. This is this is we know what yeah. the limits and Hymenoptera. Scope, scopes of our powers are. Yeah. And, and this is the solution. I, I mean, I I I think there is a a case for a conjecture that it is maximum liberty that causes maximum welfare. I, I think you might have to go that far. Maximal maximum liberty causes maximal welfare. Um, not, that, not that they're just compatible, but that there is actually a direct causal link between... It, well, it's actually, ne it never occurred to me that that wasn't true well, compatibility, I mean I mean I not only do I think I'm not, I don't I don't merely think they're compatible I think that, uh, that yeah liberty causes welfare I've always thought that liberty causes welfare yeah, what, 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 what it boils down to is saying that there's, there's, no such, there's no such thing as genuine market friendliness and that's, uh, that's a view that a lot of people don't agree or, on. Or it's not, not, so, not so on such a scale that the, the state can improve on it yeah, anyway exactly, yeah. Exactly, yeah. Uh, let's all fess up biologically, no, 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 biographically here, that um, I was accused some years ago of being obsessed about liberty. I said, I don't give a t stuff about liberty. I'm, not really, I'm concerned about liberty. Liberty is a mere negative thing. It's what free people do that I'm fussed about, in other words. Welfare. Now, it may be that someone who sees this, like myself, yeah. but is also a philosopher and a good one, says, hang on, yeah, I know all that, I know that, but I want to talk strictly and correctly about liberty, what it is. Mm. Just like that. Mm. Just like that. Well, that's fair enough. But I'm sure that all along, as you've said yourself, you're only concerned about liberty. Because, because of what it gets us. Yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. And, and if, and if a, one, a, human beings were so feckless that, that they constantly would be better off if there were some nanny telling them what to do. Or a robot. Yeah, then... Well, yeah. Liberty wouldn't be a good thing, maybe. But that's why to call it the compatibility thesis is always a bit 
coin. Because actually, it does go further. If I'm right, and if I'm right, then the, then the thesis is that the you will maximise welfare by maximising liberty, because maximising liberty, as, as super defined, is what causes the most welfare. So if you value welfare, forget about you know whether you care about liberty or not. If that's what you want, then here's how you get it. It's not just compa- I mean compatibility doesn't say anything about which way the causal link flows, or indeed if there is one. Well, uh, does it? Well, does it say if you? Well, you say you say that liberty causes welfare. You might as well say welfare causes liberty, because if you're trying to maximise welfare, you're going to have to well, do the things, things that produce liberty. Right? Uh, yeah. well, we, we know we, we do prefer welfare to liberty, given the choice, because uh, that's, that's what we see about these various schemes about setting up libertarian communities in far-flung places never really take off, because people say, well, let's all go and live on a oil platform, and there's six of us here all respecting each other's liberty. <laughs> well, no, nobody wants that, we want to live in, or, let's, or if, if we can pick a, a Greek city-state that had a lot more no, liberty that's good, very 2,000 good years ago, none of us would go back there, because we enjoy the technology yeah. and the welfare we have now. Compared to them. So we, very few of us want to trade uh, welfare for mere liberty. It's yeah. just that we're allowed to trade off. Yeah. You're, you're absolutely right. We yeah. could go. We I could go. We, we could. All the libertarians could go and live on an island. We'd have perfect liberty. We always expect each other's liberty. We always expect each other's liberty. Live on fucking coconuts. Yeah. <laughs> Nobody wants to do that. You know, we can't have a bit of. I don't know. Well, at least you'll get more. Yeah. You get more coconuts if they're copulating to Paul's chest. Did anyone else want to speak? My goodness, you've stunned them into silence. Good. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Dan.